At Category 5 TV, we trust our files to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Whether for your server, laptop, or desktop computer, you'll experience improved performance and reliability with Kingston SSDs. Get ready, it's time for the tech. Welcome to the show, everybody. Hey, just a quick reminder for you, don't forget to click like and subscribe to this channel. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna make sure that, uh, that you receive our notifications every time we post a new video or when we're live. Yep. Jeff, we talk about 3D printing every now and again. In fact, yes. we've had some great conversations, which I posted at cat5.tv slash 3D printing. And on that page, uh, we are starting our series on 3D printing. As you can see, we've gone and gotten one. Yeah, that's a very nice one. Hmm, I've settled on the Ender 3 V2 for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm brand new to 3D printing, Jeff. It's interesting that this is the one you've purchased. I have it sitting in my Amazon wish list for Christmas. Oh, yes? Yes, and I just said to Jen today, I'm like, I really want to get a 3D printer for me and the boys. Mm. And this happens to be the one that's on my list. Well, so there you go. So you get intrigued. to see it kind of firsthand. Yeah. And, and some of the reasons why I chose this printer, Jeff, is the fact that it's kind of the, it's it's out of the box, ready to print. Yes. As far as like, it's it's easy to use. It does a good print job and it's really, really affordable. Yeah. So there was um, a few I saw that's like, oh, it needs four hours assembly time. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Hey, assembly time, uh, I didn't take four hours, but yeah, it does come partially assembled, but there's a fair bit of setup that has to go into it. Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at that today. I'm going to show you how it went mm -hmm. for me to assemble it. Again, though, being completely new to 3D printing, here it is. It's like Q4 2020, and Robbie, the tech guy, has never done 3D printing before. But now, you're more of like a programming tech guy. Sure, yeah, but to be fair, Jeff, like I've had my eye on 3D printing for a long time. Yes. Um, it's well, we've kind of, covered it on the show for years. Sure, yeah, we have. Uh, we've, we've been talking about it since the Poyo 3D. Mm -hmm. Like this is going way, way back when consumer printers were like two or $3,000 yeah. and they were just coming to market. And then we've like we've had people on the show to talk about 3D printing and how it's going to change the world. Yeah, there was that book. Mm -hmm. That book and was so cool. Here we are, you know, 2020, finally getting into it. To my credit, though, I now here in our our hometown of Barrie, Ontario, hometown, our city, um, our libraries have maker spaces. Yes, they do. So early this year, I was actually email corresponding with their makerspace people okay, and talking about, okay, well, I want to get into 3D printing. How do I get started? And we were setting up for me to come in to their uh, makerspace to start 3D printing for Darn the very first COVID. time. Well, and that's what happened. So they had to shut down their makerspace yep. as I was already kind of learning. So they, they taught me that, okay, well, you need to have these STL models and so that's how I learned about things like Thingiverse and yep. sites like sites like that where people share their designs. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, because they closed down, I couldn't actually print anything. Yeah. But I didn't stop there. I kept trying to learn how to do 3D printing to see because I wanted to see is is it something that's going to be practical. So I started mm -hmm. doing designs on my computer before I even had a printer, even selected a printer. Yep. Yep. So um, I think that was a really good way for me to do it because it gave me a chance to learn some of the ins and outs of how to do it. These hooks. Yes. That was the reason you wanted to get into this, right? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. Okay. Well, n not the reason I wanted to get into 3D printing, but it, right. and we'll talk about it a after I show you how, how I've assembled this. Um, but the hooks that I'm going to show you are a big part of, you know, one of the ideas that I had. I also so love simple that too. there's a Dalek there. There's a Dalek, like, yeah. Of all the things to print. Of course. <laughs> it's like you've got to. You know, I've only printed three things, and the Dalek is one of them. And <laughs> Priorities. A, and a little kitten. Yes. <laughs> so I'm learning. Um, and you're going to be able to learn along with me. So I'm taking the approach. I'm not trying to be that, you know, there, there are a lot of gurus, 3D oh, printing sure. gurus yeah. who have been doing this for years, and they know what they're doing. And they're on YouTube, and there are some great channels. Yes. Filament Friday has been a wonderful channel for me to learn on. Uh, I'm actually running a Filament Friday firmware on the oh, Ender 3 okay. V2 right now. 
Um, there's a lot of there are a lot of gurus out there, and I'm not one of them. Right. So my approach is a little bit different with the show in the and with this series, in that you're going to get the chance to learn along with me. Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? What have I learned? How have I messed up? Yep. And what am I learning as I go? So it's a good opportunity for you to kind of see how 3D printing works and learn the things that I learn as I learn them. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I know it's going to be a lot of fun. We're already absolutely having a blast at home with the 3D printer. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. So what say we get a look at, oh, and I, I said, you know, some of the reasons that I chose this printer over some of the other options. The Ender 3 yes. from Creality, of course, is a very famous... Um, consumer printer because yep. it's cheap as far as affordability goes. It works with tons of different types of filament. For our series, we're going to be using PLA. It's a very good entry-level filament. It's known to be easy to print, and it does a reasonably good print job. Um, but it's it's pretty universally, like I can just swap that out with a different spool and start printing, and, and it's really, really easy. Mm -hmm. But Creality introduced the V2 this year, and of the Ender 3, and it kind of comes with a lot of the upgrades that people were having to create for themselves. Okay. So you get a, a lot of the stuff out of the box that otherwise um, wouldn't have been an option with an, right. an, an older gen of, of the uh, Ender 3. So there's, there's a lot of reasons to choose this printer. I'm not saying this is the best printer by any stretch, right. but as far as the economics of it go, it's really affordable and it does a great print job. And as, as far as out-of-the-box experience goes, you can see I've already been printing stuff and yes. I'm just getting started. Yeah, so, they're very clean prints. Mm -hmm. Like That's one of the things with some of the printers is you, know, you, you read reviews, you look at the the close-up photos, and it's like, wow, it's not really a smooth-looking print. It's kind of clunky. Mm -hmm. These are really clean. Thanks, Jeff. I'm a noob. Well done. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at how I went about assembling the Ender 3. Let's do that together. The Ender 3 V2 comes partially assembled. The base is assembled, but we are going to need the instruction manual because we need to make sure that everything goes together correctly. There is some assembly required. You should be able to do this reasonably easily, especially if you follow along what's in the manual, what you're going to see here today. Let's start looking at the components. We've got the extruder kit here. Um, this is what the filament is going to, it's the hot end of the printer, so this is what the filament is going to come out of. It's going to melt it and move around on all the axes. Then we've got the, uh, the screen here, which is an upgraded screen from the previous iterations of the Ender 3. It is color, but it's not touch, just like previous versions that uses the dial wheel. Here we have the XE axis kit, uh, which has the XE motors. X being left and right, E of course being the extruder, which is basically pushing the filament into the uh, hot end. We'll set that aside. And here's the material rack and the spool holder, and this is where you're actually going to put your spools of filament. And we've got some aluminum extrusions uh, for parts of the frame that we're going to put together. So this portion of the Ender 3 V2 is already assembled. This has got the heated printing platform. Uh, quite often you hear this called the bed, um, and it's all part of the machine base. It's all put together already for us. Oh, and it looks like one of my uh, leveling knobs has come off in shipping. We'll fix that in a moment. Uh, but the machine base and power supply are already assembled. That has the Y-axis tensioner and the motor uh, for the Y-axis. Power cables there. Uh, what else have we got here? We've got more extrusions uh, for the frame. These look like the Z-axis, which is your up and down uh, part of the frame. And just watch that Z-axis rod that's packaged inside. You don't want that to fall out. So you can see that's a threaded rod. It's got some grease on it, so watch. That's why it's got that sleeve. Um, but we're going to set everything aside here and get started. So here's the Z-axis motor. Uh, it has the rod coupling for that rod. Uh, so we'll assemble that in a moment. On to the final stuff. We've got some sample filament, the belts, uh, extrusion nozzles, things like that, and the belt tensioner for the Z-axis. Couple screws. Then we've 
got the Z-axis passive block. That's the wheels that are going to go up and down on the right hand side. And it came with a scraper, which is great for removing prints from the bed or slashing the eyes of your enemies. And we've got a couple of tools here and screws and such for the assembly itself. And there's also some side cutters included in there as well. Little bonus. So first things first, I'm going to replace that bed leveling knob that uh, came off during shipping. Ah, there it is. So it should just go right on there. Our first 3D printer repair right there. <laughs> note as I'm moving things around here that glass bed is held onto the heating platform by a couple of clips. Just make sure those clips are snug before you start moving it around like I am here because you don't want that to fall off. It shouldn't but just keep in mind. There's the extruder with the hot end of our 3D printer. And back to the book. Jeff will be so proud of me to see me reading the manual. I'm just going to kind of lay everything out here. We've got the Z-axis switch, uh, came with an SD card and card reader, like a USB reader. Uh, just lay everything out so that it's easy access as I'm going through the manual and figuring out how to set everything up. And there's the side cutters that they've included for you. That's great for trimming pieces of your uh, 3D prints, especially if you have any platforming, uh, you're going to need those. Now it is a bit of a process to work your way through the instruction manual and assemble your Ender 3 V2, as I'm about to do. So just follow along in your manual, and I'm going to speed things up through the magic of television. we have it, the Ender 3 V2 is fully assembled and ready to print. When we come back after this quick break, we're going to talk about my first impressions as we print our very first 3D prints on the Creality Ender 3 V2. Stick around.
Welcome back. You'll notice at the end of the fast motion video there, this particular um, cabling here was on the outside of the top uh, extrusion. Uh, so I had to just simply remove two screws and put it inside. But you'll save a bit of time, uh, maybe if you make a note of the position of this. It wasn't quite clear in the manual, and there okay. were a couple of things like that that just weren't quite clear, but easy enough to figure out as sure. long as you're patient and, and uh, take your time. But uh, I think now that I've assembled it, Jeff, I could probably throw one of these together in half the time. Oh, that's easily. Good. How, so, and how long did it take you to assemble this? Well, I mean, I was shooting video and everything, so it's not really a fair, um, fair equation, enough. right? Because you know, I had eight cameras around me, and I'm setting everything up and, and setting up my shots and things. But oh, you got to uh, look good for camera. I uh, got it. Uh, about an hour and a half it took me okay. altogether. So I think uh, you could probably put this together in about a half hour. Realistically, That's pretty decent. Yeah, yeah. So the the first things that I've noted as a brand new 3D printer guy, maker, uh, never 3D printed anything in my life. <laughs> The, the first thing I did was I leveled the bed, and that's really, really important to use these dial wheels, use a piece of paper, and I'm going to be demonstrating how to do that. There are videos on YouTube, but okay. we will make that part of the series as well. Okay. Um, leveling the bed is the first thing that you need to do. Once it's level and things look good, then you can start your 3D print. So Perfect. it came with an SD card, as you noted there, and um, the SD card has some G-code models on it. So oh, okay. my son Liam wanted to print the cat. It was just on, our, on the screen we just saw there's a cat. So right. let's try that. It makes and sense. You guys have cats. We do now. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so he printed this. And as you mentioned, Jeff, like it, it came out really, really great. So this was our very, very it's first print. Smooth. Yeah, so this was just the G-code that was included on the SD card, and it came out absolutely beautiful, yep. and he's thrilled with that. So that was our very, very first print on day one. Okay. So then day two came, and nothing was working. The really? bed wasn't uh, so because I'm starting to I'm starting to play around with my own designs. Um, you mentioned these hooks. We're going to yes. look at those, but th so the hooks were going to be my second print. Okay. I designed my own mask hooks yes and these are these are meant to go on a half inch pipe mm -hmm. so the cold water uh, pipe in our laundry room because we have an unfinished laundry yes. room yeah this clips on to the half inch pipe and it gives uh, us a place to dry our uh, reusable washable masks yep. our face masks um, so it's just a, a neat little thing that i came up with but my wife was, was thinking like, hey, this is really, really high. I can't quite reach it. So the next iteration was a little bit longer and a little bit longer. And I went through a couple of iterations. So this was the, the first one was just this little tiny guy. Yep. Right. And then the next one was a little bit longer. And then finally, the final print came out like this. So I simply, I simply extended the, uh, the length of it. And I designed this in a program called Tinkercad, which is a Tinkercad, free okay. it's a free website, yep. Tinkercad.com. All the links of the tools that I'm using throughout the course of the series are at cat5.tv slash 3D printing. Uh, but that's what I use to design this. Very cool. So I basically just I laid it out in Tinkercad and and that's what I came up with. Cool. So and it printed great once I figured it out. But yeah. day two came and nothing was working. And I say that because I was struggling to get the bed to level because nothing was sticking to the bed. And it's really, oh. really important. What okay. I found is it's very important that the first couple of layers are stuck to the bed. Because if they're not, as the printer is moving up, it's going gonna, gonna to lose adhesion yeah. and it's going to move. The, the print is going to move and then it's not going to be printing the right thing in the right spot and it's not going to work out. Was the bed heating up? The bed was heating up to 60 degrees Celsius. Okay. Everything was working there. So I did everything from, I, I gave it a quick wipe down with some isopropyl alcohol. Yep. Um, I upgraded the firmware to one from Filament Friday because it came with, an, like the original firmware had some bugs in it that he'd mentioned. Oh, okay. And so I installed his firmware okay. and it still wasn't working for me, Jeff. Hmm. And then I started thinking because, you know, I'm, I'm the troubleshooter. Right. Yes. So I've tried everything. Every time I leveled the bed, it still wasn't adhering to the bed. So then I started saying, okay, well, what's different between yesterday and today? And the one thing that I came up with is our first day print was from the G code provided by Creality. Yeah. Creality. My second print, second day print, 
was a G code that I created. Now understand, so I've learned a couple of things. So I mentioned that I, I made this in Tinkercad, I designed it in Tinkercad, but f that gives you an STL file. Yes. Or an OBJ or whatever. So these are the file extensions. So that STL file can't go to the printer. You need what's called a G code, which is a file that tells it how to build the layers. Okay. So that's, uh, I'm using a program called Cura, which is also free. Uh, links again at cat5.tv slash 3D printing. And with that software, um, it creates the slice layers. Yes. Okay. And it, it spews out a file called a G code file. And so, the G code for this was on the SD card, came with it. The G code for this is something that I made in Cura. Okay. So then I started thinking, okay, well, what's different? So I got researching, I got looking into it. And then finally, after several hours of tinkering, Jeff, I found out that G code is actually a text file, a script. Oh. So I opened it in my text editor yep. and looked at it and I started seeing that this is just a script. It's like code. Yep. So then I looked at the code for this one and I looked at the code for mine and I compared the difference at the start of the file and found that my G code from Cura was telling the extruder to raise two millimeters at the start of the print and there was a comment that said, oh, so that it doesn't scratch the print bed. And it was raising a full two millimeters. So I started looking, so I started another print and I looked down at the extruder and sure enough, a small at the gap. beginning, at the beginning of the print, I saw the extruder go up two millimeters so it wasn't quite down on the bed. So it wasn't able to adhere to the bed. So I went in, I copied the header from this G code and pasted it over top the header of fine. my G code. And I printed out a good 10, 15 of these hooks. So and it worked perfectly. Why the different header? Because different, you didn't program that. Different either. start code. No, it was just the default profile. So it was, huh. it had this raise up two millimeters or whatever. So, so having replaced it with this header, the start code from yep. this one, everything printed just fine. So I was like, oh, so that was a revelation for me to realize that the G code is an editable script that you can go in and you can modify. And then I'm thinking about all the wonderful things that you can do with that knowledge. Yeah. And it's wonderful. So then I took that huh. G code, the, the start part of the G code, and I pasted it into my profile in Cura to always use that as my start code. That's smart. Replacing the one that came with it. Uh, made a couple of little mini modifications based on the knowledge that I had accumulated from the research that I had done. Yep. And uh, now I've got a start code that is working like that. Huh. Just beautiful. So every I print comes out nice. how many people would have re run into that issue and would have said the machine's just not working? Nobody was saying, check the start code on your G code. Everybody was saying, huh. okay, make sure your bed is level. Yeah, I did that. 10 times, make sure that the bed is clean. Yeah, I did that. Make sure, you know, that there's no Interesting. like, yeah. So all this stuff, make sure the bed temperature is good. Uh, the G code from Cura was defaulting to 50 degrees Celsius. I noticed that this one was 60 degrees Celsius. So, so I increased it. 60, yeah. Yeah. And that was done through the material mm -hmm. in Cura. Again, I'm going to show you how to do all these things. So wow. don't worry. Okay. But that's what I learned. So then we started printing other things, and my other son, Zach, said, I really want a Dalek. Yes. And so we got onto Thingiverse and downloaded the STL file for a Dalek. Now, that is not monochromatic. That's got two colors. You're right. So what we actually did is we first printed these parts. Okay. Okay, so these little guys, the extensions, and these actually clip into the Dalek. So we printed it in two parts. Very cool. Yeah. Um, you'll see that these are all white. Yes. They are all printed, Jeff, with that sample spool of filament. That's I was able the to, sample. I was able to get this out of the sam sample that they wow. sent. Wow. So I didn't even have to tap into my purchased filament. So that is uh, what we came up with for, for Zach as well. Very so neat. I was really, really impressed with that. And he's very, very happy with that model. Uh, when I was removing the, um, the supports for the, uh, the black parts, because yep. they're so tiny, yes. I kind of clipped a little bit too far in places, but we can reprint those little parts. I was about to say, you can reprint. And we start talking about how, because they're attachments, we could create other attachments and yes. play around with all that kind of stuff. So speaking of wanting to um, 
basically adapt our designs to our own needs, so yep. creating attachments and things like that. The next thing that we wanted to do, is, well, he wanted to print in black. Of course. So I got a little spool, 250 grams of black filament. Yep. And it's fine, but it was affordable because it's only 250 grams. I didn't need a big one yeah. kilogram thing. But it doesn't fit on the spool holder because the hole is too small. Oh, no. So I was like, well, what do I do? What do I do, Jeff? Any you suggestions? You print a new spool holder. You print a new spool holder. <laughs> so I actually, I went on and, and I started designing based on some designs that I found on Thingiverse. But I created this huh. little guy. So this is printed with the uh, transparent uh, filament. Yep. Um, this is a new spool holder specifically designed to hold these little spools. Well, so I you. built, I made this spool holder specifically to replace that, and it just screws on. Yep. And allows me to to print using the 250 gram spools. So then I'm like, I can actually adapt my 3D printer, create a, accessories and attachments. Yeah. That. I, I don't have to get on Amazon and buy new parts or try That's to track right. down a you smaller spool yourself. holder. You print it yourself. So how cool is that? That's awesome. So overall, my experience so far has been great. I'm learning as I go, and that's yep. part of the fun. Uh, my kids have been so patient as I've been learning, and sure. that's, that's been a good experience for them, I think, as well. Yeah. Uh, but the Ender 3 V2 has been, I mean, so far so good. It's a fantastic little printer. It's quiet. It's got the quiet circuit. Oh, okay. uh, the the yes. the board itself is like a uh, I don't know it's upgraded on the uh, V2 hmm. um, and apparently is quieter than the older versions. We're going to be looking at the actual sound that it generates. But you hear the fans. Of course, um, there is the cooling system to keep things cool. Yep. Um, but uh, it's reasonably quiet. Like we could have it running right here, and it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't probably even be picked up on our microphones. Very so. neat. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, that's a, a bit of a primer as to, you know, here I am. I'm brand new to 3D printing, and I'm 3D printing. I'm doing my own designs. I'm using free software uh, in my browser. In uh, I'm, I'm using Cura, which is an actual installed application that you can yep. download and install. I did find Tinkercad has one limitation, being a free online um, service, is that the um, STL files have to be below 25 megabytes. Oh, okay, so you're limited on size. Yes. Now, oh, okay. that's not a problem when they're only like 200 kilobytes and things yes. like that. But as soon as I got into some more sophisticated designs, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is 26 megabytes, and I can't mm. edit it in Tinkercad. So that will eventually lead me to start looking at other things. But I think yes. Tinkercad is a really good starting point. Okay. So cat5.tv slash 3D printing is where you want to go to follow along with this series, learn from my mistakes and from my victories. And uh, I'm also sharing absolutely everything that I do um, through GitHub. You'll see links there. So I've got the designs here on uh, my, uh, what is it called? My mini, is it my mini maker or something like that? I started using Thingiverse, but it's really buggy. Yeah. So, um, You'll see the links there anyways, cat5.tv slash 3D printing. I'm still learning all the terms. I'm still learning how everything works. That's exciting. I'm brand new to it. But I am sharing everything that I've learned. And yeah. even that start code for, for Cura is available on my GitHub repository oh, awesome. as well. So Excellent. So that'll get you started as, as well. So all the tips. This, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is the one that's actually sitting on my Amazon yeah. wish list. Yeah. So uh, if you could... Do me a favor mm. and just let my wife know how amazing this is. Yeah, I'll just kind of <laughs> let her know. I'm just going to start sending her all the videos. Yes, please Hey, check do. this out. I hear Jeff might be interested in 3D printing. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> totally amazing. Yeah. And if you follow along the, with the series, Jeff, you're going to have a real good head start on me because all Absolutely. the things that I've had to learn the hard way, um, you're going to be able mm. to do. And even so much as these designs are available for you through my GitHub. Now... Maybe this doesn't fit into your full review, but I've got to ask, why clear filament as opposed to the typical <laughs> red, white, blue? You've you got to buy filament anyway. So right. I, needed, I needed filament to print the small spool Yes. because I didn't have a small spool to yes. print with the cheap filament, right. the 250 gram filament. The reason that I got translucent filament is because I'm going to be making signage for Category 5. Oh, yes. So okay. The first handful of layers so about a half an inch you are going to be translucent so that light 
so that light, I yes, us talking about they're going to have LEDs inside. Okay. Uh, and then the top layer is going to be black. So nice. I thought, hey, I've got to buy filament anyways. I'm going to buy uh, a roll of the translucent filament because I'm going to be using it anyways. And it looks really cool. Yeah. It does totally look really nice. Yeah. That's great. Well, there you have it. Let's head over to the newsroom. Here's Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The public beta of SpaceX Starlink internet service has begun. YouTube DL has been hit with a DMCA takedown by the RIAA. Ubuntu Groovy Gorilla adds Raspberry Pi as a first-class citizen. Zoom has added end-to-end -end encryption for all for free, though there are caveats and we'll tell you what they are. And a NASA spacecraft, spacecraft successfully touched down on an asteroid to collect a sample. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. The public beta space of SpaceX Starlink internet service has begun. SpaceX has begun sending email invitations to Starlink's public beta and will charge beta users $99 per month, plus a one-time fee of $499 for the user terminal, mounting tripod, and router. The emails are being sent to people who previously registered interest in the service on the Starlink website. SpaceX is calling it the better-than-nothing beta, perhaps partly because the Starlink satellite service will be most useful to people who can't get cable or fiber broadband. But the email also says, as you can tell from the title, we are trying to lo lower your initial expectations. The email reads, expect to see data speeds vary from 50 to 150 megabits per second and latency from 20 to 40 milliseconds over the next several months as we enhance the Starlink system. There will also be brief periods of no connectivity at all. As we launch more satellites, install more ground stations and improve our networking software, data speed latency and uptime will improve dramatically. For latency, we expect to achieve 16 to 19 milliseconds by summer 2021. There is apparently no data cap. A Starlink mobile app to help beta users set up and manage the surface also just went live on Apple's App Store and Google Play. Elon Musk recently said that the public beta will be for the northern U.S. and hopefully southern Canada. SpaceX plans to provide Starlink to a school district in Texas in early 2021, but that doesn't mean the public beta is available to anyone in the south. The wait may not be too long, though, as SpaceX has said it will reach near global coverage of the populated world by 2021. You know, that Starlink story is an interesting one. Uh, because for so long we have been hearing about this project, mm -hmm. hearing about how it's going to change the face of the globe with providing internet, high-speed internet to, you know, unreachable areas. So it, it's interesting that they're offering this beta version to lower expectations. That's totally contrary to what companies do. They want to heighten expectations. Mm. So why would they take that approach when? Quite frankly, if you don't have access to internet, even to hear that you can get, you know, 50 meg download speeds is phenomenal. Sure. Like yeah. that, that, that to me is great. I mean, but it's satellite. You expect that there's going to be downtime. You expect that there's going to be interference from weather. So I, I don't understand why they would call this about lowering expectations. Like what were people thinking they were going to get? Well, I mean, we know that it's meant to be really, really fast. And they're saying yeah. it's not yet there. No, of so course. So let's try it out, but no, it's not yet there. Yeah. So I think, you know, they have to set expectations, perhaps, yeah. to avoid, you know, complaints and things like that. But I think about, like, my, it's, it's hard for us to fathom if we live in a city that there are places still that don't have high-speed internet. I, I, I'm literally there thinking about my church. Yeah. We are. Yeah, you're just on the outskirts. We're, the, we're less than a kilometer mm -hmm. from the edge of Barrie. We cannot get anything internet wise other than sure your basic dsl our old studio studio oh, d brutal same deal yeah my father-in-law is using lte internet at home because they do not have high speed internet where they live that's what we have at the church and that's unreal 200 bucks a month just to have basic internet just for basic lte internet man so yeah. i mean like this starlink for the price it's going to be 
could be a great so, option. Yes, for, us. for you, for you then in that case, or for my father-in-law, it's a great option, and it's probably going to be better than what they currently have. So maybe setting the expectations low in that you know those of us who have gig internet aren't, yeah, okay, aren't going enough. out and and signing up for the new you know this is the latest and greatest from spacex right so it's going to be the best well they're setting the expectations low purposefully so that it's the right market yeah i, I, think I, that I guess might have if you're it. in a city where you've got that high speed but if you have nothing yes i mean what they're offering for speeds is phenomenal it is yeah. so i mean i'm i'm excited at first, I wasn't sure how I felt about this project when mm -hmm. I first heard about it because I'm like, oh, he just wants to roll space the world. debris. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, but now that I'm starting to see it roll out, I'm getting excited about. It. But what's interesting is that it's Upper U.S., possibly Lower Canada for their beta we'll testing. Why not beta test in like a low cert, like pick somewhere along the equator of Africa, maybe? You know, like some remote. Well, it makes sense though that they would want to test it. In, in a, a place where, area. well, think of it this way: if if it went down, I have something else to fall back on. Yeah, I have the 4G infrastructure to fall back on if I needed right. to. So you know, maybe that has something to do with it. I mean, we're speculating here, but there that there are be. so many thoughts. Yeah, but hey, how how does something like Starlink affect you? Is it something that would be better than what you have, or is mm -hmm. it a severe downgrade? Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. But I think in a lot of cases, this is going to bring high-speed internet to areas that currently don't have it. And not yes. only that, Jeff, but we've hit on it in the past when we've talked about Starlink, and that's that in an event of natural disaster or infrastructure um, issues, it's an opportunity to still receive good, solid internet, yes. high-speed internet that is not reliant on things like towers. Yes. Right? Now, what, one of the things that will be interesting is because, I mean, this is not new. Like, satellite internet is already here. Well, good satellite internet well, is new. That's that's <laughs> the challenge here is, uh, I mean, I used to, another iteration of my working life, I was a, uh, a sur uh, recognized installer for satellite internet. Um, so I have an inner working of, or an, an inner understanding of how it works. And it was quite uh, cumbersome mm. and unreliable. Yep. I mean, the dish moves just a slight bit from wind. Right. And you're out. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested to see how Starlink's internet works in that regard and if a little bit of wind is going to knock it out or if it's a more stable platform. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. Mm -hmm. Maybe the beta test will show some results. So we'll see over the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. We've got to head back to Becca. YouTube DL has been hit with a DMCA takedown by the Recording Industry Association of America. The RIAA has issued a DMCA takedown on the open source project YouTube DL on their GitHub repository. This is done under the guise of protecting content creators from having their ad revenue stolen. YouTube DL, however, is often used by archivists and users who suffer from a slow internet connection in order to allow them to watch the content. There are, of course, those that use it to circumvent ads, but we can't pretend ad blockers don't exist, which accomplish the same goal with less effort. So are ad blockers next on the list? Here at Category 5, we're content creators. We post our videos on YouTube and we depend on the revenue it generates. But like the Electronic Frontier Foundation points out, we believe YouTube DL is a legitimate tool with a world of lawful uses. See, we know we have viewers who are watching in areas where internet just isn't very good. We've heard from troops who watch our show in their tents while at war. We have fans who live in areas where high-speed internet just doesn't exist yet. So we make sure they have access to our content for free with the hope that they will support us through Patreon if they're able. We received an email from a viewer this week asking us how they can watch our show while circumventing YouTube. Is it surprising that we, the very content creators who rely on the re revenue YouTube provides, responded by providing BitTorrent files of all 13 past seasons, plus recommended the download button found on the page of every episode we publish on our website? As content creators, we understand the need for res revenue. It costs a lot of money to do what we do. But for the RIAA to demand YouTube DL be shut down seems shady. The Electronic Frontier Foundation fights these types of battles on behalf of open source projects. You can help protect projects like YouTube DL by donating at EFF.org. 
Last week, Canonical released the latest intermediate version of Ubuntu 20.10, Groovy Gorilla, which for the first time adds first-class platform support for the Raspberry Pi 4. Groovy Gorilla itself is a pretty typical interim release, offering an updated GNOME version with lots of bug fixes and small feature additions. Support has also been added for Windows Active Directory in the Ubiquiti OS installer itself. And while it has been possible for some time to install Ubuntu on Raspberry Pi hardware, up until now that has been strictly a community effort. The Pi itself ships with Raspberry Pi OS, a Debian-based distribution whose origins began with the Pi community, but which has since been officially adopted and supported by the Raspberry Pi Foundation itself. While Canonical added the Pi as a supported platform in 20.04 earlier this year, that support was only for the Ubuntu server distribution, not desktop. With 20.10 Groovy Gorilla, Canonical has added full desktop support for the Pi 4. Martin Wimpress, Canonical's Director of Engineering for the Ubuntu Desktop, says this means the Pi is now a first-class citizen. Canonical guarantees the same level of integration, QA, and support from kernel to user space that it does for a standard PC. The entire Ubuntu software repository is available and supported on the Pi. Of course, that's other than architecture-specific packages that start with names like i386 and are therefore not compatible with the Raspberry Pi's ARM processor. If you'd like to install Ubuntu 20.10 desktop on the Pi, you'll need a 4GB or 8GB Raspberry Pi. As long as you meet the hardware requirements, the install is a breeze. Ubuntu 20.10 Desktop is an option in the standard Raspberry Pi imager now. The imager itself is available for Linux, Windows, or Mac platforms. To get up and running, insert a 4GB plus microSD card, open the imager, choose Ubuntu 20.10, and click Write. A few minutes later, you'll be able to boot the official Ubuntu 20.10 for Raspberry Pi 4. Zoom has added end-to-end -end encryption for all for free, though there are caveats and we'll tell you what they are. And a NASA spacecraft successfully touched down on an asteroid to collect a sample. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. the world of cryptos and welcome back to the crypto corner this week i've got some really good news for you um, if we look at the market by the time i'm recording this year the price of bitcoin is at 13,128, uh, which is equivalent to 2.3 percent increase in the last 24 hours and 14 percent in the last seven days i think that's fantastic news and one reason why i believe that is if we compare it to the stock exchange the u.s stock exchange or the gold price, then there is a decoupling happening. Um, it is not confirmed yet. Uh, that will take some time, but at least there is a decoupling at the moment. This is the chart, uh, chart since uh, beginning of October. And uh, the red line is the red uh, curve is the US stock exchange. The blue is the gold price. And so you see there's a significant gap uh, especially since yesterday where we had a huge drop in the stock exchange in the US stock exchange uh, to uh, Bitcoin. So I think that's that's great news. It's to be expected because it's a complete uh, different asset commodity. And so let's see what will happen. The other good news is uh, PayPal. Uh, PayPal decided to get involved in cryptocurrencies. And so you can buy now uh, some cryptocurrencies on their platform. And the great news is because they have got over 340 million users. And you can, uh, by using PayPal, pay for services and goods. And you can now use, for example, Bitcoin to pay for services and goods. But at least that they're offering this here to this huge community is, I think, fantastic news. Also, one that I have to take with a smile is our friends from JP Morgan, uh, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. And in 2017, Jamie Dimon, their CEO, said that Bitcoin is a fraud and will blow up. He also said that he, if he finds somebody in his organization 
uh, trading uh, cryptocurrencies, that person will be fired on the spot. Now, like in politics, things can change significantly and dramatically. And so this is, uh, happened. Uh, this was published uh, two days ago uh, by JP Morgan, where they are now saying Bitcoin has considerable upside as it's better competes with gold as an alternative currency. I find that fantastic news because an organization embedded in the old system like JP Morgan suddenly changes their opinion 180 degrees is for me extremely bullish. Not financial advice, but for me, that's a bullish sign. So, um, yeah, uh, one thing I'd like to focus on is it's a question that a lot of people are asking us in regards to private keys and public keys. Um, so I'd like to spend a few minutes on that subject. And for that, I pulled up a website called iancoleman.io because this is uh, uses um, the web the the content fantastically well and uh, so there is somebody in bitcoin or a team that came up with this process of how to convert uh, a, a private key into a public key and it expanded that and now a lot of different cryptocurrencies are using the same process and that's why it's called bip39 or bip44 because it's bitcoin improvement protocol but other uh, uh, currencies are using that. So I just gen clicked on generated on 24 words. And so out of a repository, uh, the system generated 24 words. And that those are the words that you need to remember. Uh, when you generate a, a wallet, for example, you create a new wallet, uh, the wallet will uh, generate those 24 words. And those are the ones that you have to remember because everything derives from those 24 words. So with a little bit, this is a little bit technical here, but from those 24 words, we deduct the private key. From that private key, we deduct the public key, and that public key then generates the address. Yeah, so, and the reason that is done is that there's no way in the world that you can get back to the private key. That's why cryptocurrency is so secure. Yeah, and so, what you do is you take the private key, you hash it, that's a special crypto cryptographic process. And with that, you generate the public key and the public key is hashed twice and that generates the address. The reason that this is done is that there might be in future some computers that are able to uh, deduct from the public key the private key. They don't exist yet, but we're thinking well ahead in the future. And that's why we are using the address as the key that you uh, send to other people in case uh, you want to receive some Bitcoin or so. So um, this is all the magic behind it. It's based on those 24 words. Those 24 words generate the private key. The private key generates the public key and the public key generates the address and address is what we use. And that set is used in many other, um, like here, uh, cryptocurrencies. They use the same, um, same process. Anyway, that's it uh, from me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, thank you very much for watching. Please leave a like. It helps us. We need to grow. And um, yeah, come back next week. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency markets. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever changing and always volatile. So only invest what you can afford to lose. Now here's Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Zoom has added end-to-end -end encryption to its video conferencing service at no additional cost for all users, whether they are paying subscribers or not. The feature has been long awaited given the service's massive adoption as a result of pandemic lockdowns, something that swung a spotlight on its patchy security. The company announced on Tuesday that the new feature is available now as a technical preview for the next 30 days and is looking for user feedback before rolling it out en masse. Zoom CISO Jason Lee gives kudos to Keybase who joined the company in May to develop the security feature, taking just six months to do so. Zoom says its end-to-end -end encryption will use 256-bit AES GCM and a secure key exchange is performed beforehand to ensure only the participants on the call can decrypt each other's part of the conversations and no eavesdroppers, not even Zoom itself, can listen in.
Zoom had already encrypted some of its uh, communications, though it wasn't truly end-to-end -end until now. In order to use the end-to-end -end encryption, an account admin has to enable the feature. Zoom's end-to-end -end encryption is limited to 200 participants, so for larger meetings where encryption may not be a needed feature, such as a public forum or a digital comic con, it can be disabled to allow more people to join. Other restrictions of the service are a lack of cloud recording and live transcription. Breakout rooms, polling, and one-to-one -one private chats are also unavailable when end-to-end -end encryption are on, as are live emojis. Perhaps the biggest caveat of all, though, is that each user must have the official Zoom client installed in order to participate. So browser-based participation will not be available for encrypted meetings. Third-party Zoom clients will also not work when end-to-end -end encryption is enabled. The feature is available on new releases of the Zoom software for Mac OS, Windows, Android, Linux, and iOS. After orbiting the near-Earth asteroid Bennu for nearly two years, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft successfully touched down and reached out its robotic arm to collect a sample from the asteroid's surface last week. The sample will be returned to Earth in 2023. To achieve this historic first for NASA, a van-sized spacecraft had to briefly touch down its arm in a landing site called Nightingale. The site is the width of a few parking spaces. The arm reached out to collect a sample, which could be between 2 ounces and 2 kilograms. Then the spacecraft backed away to safety. We have never done this before. We're actually going to collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag sam, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample, and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. Everything went perfectly based on the data returned by the spacecraft, according to Dante Loretta, the mission's principal investigator and a professor at the University of Arizona Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He said he feels transcendent and the team is exuberant based on the current data. Loretta said in a statement, After over a decade of planning, the team is overjoyed at the success of today's sampling attempt. I look forward to analyzing the data and to determine the mass of sample collected. We have to verify that we have a proper sample. First, we're going to image the tag SAM head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're going to do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement in which we stick out the arm and we spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home or if we have to try again. Preliminary data show the sampling head touched Bennu's surface for approximately six seconds, after which the spacecraft performed a back away burn. Thomas Serbuchan, Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, said in a statement, A piece of primordial rock that has witnessed our solar system's entire history may now be ready to come home for generations of scientific discovery, and we can't wait to see what comes next. The mission, which stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, Regolith Explorer, launched in September 2016. Since arriving at Bennu, the spacecraft and its cameras have been collecting and sending back data and images to help the team learn more about the asteroid's composition and map out the best potential landing sites to collect samples. The main event of the mission is the Touch and Go Sample Collection Event, or TAG, that occurred last week. 
The event took about four and a half hours total to unfold, and the spacecraft executed three maneuvers to collect the sample from Bennu, which could help scientists understand not only more about asteroids that could impact Earth, but also about how planets formed and life began. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and, sub and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Halloween this year is a little bit of an oddball. Really? What is that? Well, we may not be able to necessarily do trick-or-treating or, treating or yeah. have big parties like we normally would, but we can still have fun. No, we can't. Yeah, we absolutely can. So tonight, in kind of celebration, happy Halloween, uh, we're going to do three things. First of all, I'm going to turn you into a zombie. Second of all, we're going to learn a story from Canadian folklore. And thirdly, we're going to take a tour of the Orville. And I hear Orville's something something has gone wrong. Unless you follow Something has gone very, very wrong. Jeff, what good is a neural network if you can't use it to turn yourself into a zombie? You know what? I Answer wake up every morning asking myself that question. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, give me a really good toothy smile. No, just give me a smile. Come on. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we got the picture. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my web browser because this tool is available through your web browser. That means there's no app to install. Okay. It doesn't collect anything other than just Google Analytics. It's perfectly safe and uh, you don't have to put it in and it's platform agnostic. Doesn't matter if you're on your computer, your phone, your tablet, whatever. You go to makemeazombie.com and we're going to browse to that picture that I just took of Jeff. There he is. And we're going to click on that and click make me a zombie. Okay. What's happening is, is that again, a general adversarial network, a neural network is now taking your photo and turning you into a zombie. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh my gosh! <laughs> wow. Uh, that's... Wow. You like that? Note to self, don't become the undead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeff. That is fantastic. I feel like I'm the guinea pig of this show. Make me... <laughs> make me a zombie.com and you can do that on any device. <laughs> That's fun. Becca Ferguson from the Category 5.TV newsroom is an author, and she's yes. been putting together a series of ghost stories and folklore, yes. and we've been putting it together as a video series. So let's jump over to that. Here's a little sample for you of Catching Nuance. Catching Nuance. Mm. Canadian folklore and ghost stories as retold by author Becca Ferguson. Narrated by Robbie Ferguson. This is La Corriveau of New France, Quebec. In 1761, St. Valier, New France, 15 months after the mysterious death of her first husband, Marie Joseph Corriveau married a second farmer. Two years later, he was found dead in the barn with his head smashed in. At first, his death was deemed accidental. Multiple kicks from a horse's hooves, but rumors of murder quickly spread around the town. The local British military authorities soon charged Marie Joseph's father, Joseph Corriveau. His daughter was thought to be an accessory only, and given 60 lashes, the letter M branded onto her hand with a hot iron. Joseph, however, admitted that his daughter was the murderer claiming she'd killed her abusive husband with two blows from the back of a hatchet while he slept. 
thus, thereby found guilty by the tribunal, she was put to death in Quebec City by hanging. Her corpse was fastened into an iron cage gibbet and dangled from a tree branch at the crossroads of St. Joseph Street and De L'Entente Boulevard in Lévis. There it rotted on public display for an entire month, feasted upon by flies and maggots, torn asunder by crows. It wasn't long before the hauntings began. Travelers soon learned not to take the river road leading past the cage at night, lest her vacant eyes should glow blood red and her shackled leathery arms should stretch out toward them. Even after the gibbet was taken down, her body buried within the cage, the hauntings continued, her spirit rising from the grave each night to torment travelers. One such night, a well-known citizen named Dubé was walking alongside the St. Lawrence River when the air turned chill. He stopped short just as a pair of bony fingers closed in around his throat from behind. Tendrils of greasy black hair tickled his cheeks and a ragged voice whispered, Take me across the river. Dubé swung around, glimpsing over his shoulder a set of red eyes and yellow teeth within a face of putrefied flesh. He fell to his knees, tearing at the slimy hands that refused to let go. Leave me, he screamed, then passed out from fright. The next morning, his wife found him and shook him awake on the vacant road. His story spread and a curate was called in to exercise the spirit. A century later, the cage was dug up during an expansion project and put in a church cellar. It was stolen and sold to an American who put it in his museum in a glass display case with a placard that read simply, From Quebec. In time, it was returned to Canada and placed permanently in the Museum of Civilization in Quebec City. You can catch more folklore and ghost stories from Catching Nuance on our website, category5.tv. Well, Jeff, this is the Orville Interactive Fan Experience with the Halloween update, which you can download for free through Steam. Now, to start the Halloween event, all you need to do is go to the Quantum Control Console on the bridge and go to the Takros Gul location. Now, this is meant to be a single-player event, but for us right now, we're just basically running around. We're not getting into the scenario. When you play it, make sure you press I in order to see which consoles need repair, and then you'll be able to participate in the actual scenario. But as I say, we're just going to run around and show you what it looks like. Let's go. Red alert. That's not me doing that. What? Are... Hold on. What? It's like we're spinning. Are we in a... Whoa, whoa, whoa. What on earth? Okay, what happened there? Are we hitting the normal? Where are we? It seems like, eh? Welcome, <gasps> weary traveler, to my domain. I can find you a shiny starship of no use to you now. <laughs> Who is that? I have a challenge for you. A challenge you'll no doubt fail disastrously. I'll let you leave and continue on with your adventures around the galaxy. If you can repair all nine of the damaged consoles on your starship, that simple. However, <laughs> things are never that simple. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> Who's taking control of the ship? Some kind of supreme being. Where? I can't help it if you're afraid of clones. Where are you going? No idea, Jeff. Trying to get. Let's try to get out of here. Is it weird that I like 
the sound of screaming. <laughs> The spider gave me the heebie-jeebies. Oh, the clown. I did not like mm. that clown. You can install the Orville fan experience for free. It's in Steam right now. Give it a go. We'll be right back after this. you've had fun with us this week it's sure been a blast for us yeah. happy halloween have a safe one and uh have a wonderful wonderful week we're looking forward to seeing you in two weeks time because next week is production week here yes. at category 5 tv I about that yeah and if you haven't uh been following our schedule make sure you go on to our website category 5.tv and you'll see our calendar on the uh, bottom of the home page mm -hmm. Don't forget, we are on Twitter at Category 5 TV, and I'd really appreciate it if you would consider becoming part of our Patreon fleet. Head on over to patreon.com slash Category 5. It's a great way to support the content that we create here at Category 5 TV, but at the same time, you're going to gain access to some behind the scenes and uh, a lot of great content that is only available to our patrons. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Bye.